Hello, hi everyone, very good morning and um, welcome to this lecture on the role of a CKD nurse educator. So this lecture is brought about in conjunction with World Kidney Day 2021 and myself, I'm Karina and representing our clinical CKD nurse educators in University of Malaya Medical Centre, I'm proud to present you who is a CKD nurse and what are they actually doing as a CKD nurse. Now ladies and gentlemen, before we proceed to the gist of our lecture today, allow me just to bring you around World Kidney Day 2021 and its most important points. Now, this year, World Kidney Day is focused on kidney health for everyone, everywhere, living well with kidney disease. Now, this year, the committee of the World Kidney Day has brought out four important points, and that is, number one, empowering patients and caregivers. Now, this is to actually encourage patients to have the necessary knowledge to be able to engage in shared decision-making. Patients are encouraged to develop the skills and support for effective management. Point number two, the need for strengthened partnership with patients. Now, ladies and gentlemen, meaningful and consistent communication with patients and caregivers shall enable them to involve in the development, implementation and evaluation of interventions for their disease. Isn't that important to everyone? Yes, it is. Now, the third point they brought about is the need for the strength-based approach. What is a strength-based approach? Is the strategy focused on supporting patients' resilience, to harness social connections, to build patient awareness and knowledge, to facilitate access to support, and to establish confidence and control in self-management. Last but not least, the need for more effective and more integrated and holistic symptom management. Now, focus on this to help patients and their caregivers lead a better health-related quality of life, which includes, number one, effective strategies to identify and manage symptoms that causes suffering, such as pain, sleep issues, anxiety, depression, stress, mobility, frailty, and of course, many others that we may not know, only the patients can and caregivers are aware. Now, the last one, providing more education and management strategies to alleviate the symptoms. Okay, what are CKD nurses meant in this whole context? Okay, so let's go into this lecture today. Now, I'll bring you into two parts of my talk today. Number one, I'll introduce to you, I'll give you an overview a little bit about chronic kidney disease, the data, the causal factors. And the next one, pre-dialysis education and our roles. Okay, now, part one. Let's look at the introduction, the overview. Chronic kidney disease in Malaysia based on two separate studies that has been done. In 2011, the NHSM National Health Morbidity Survey, in a population of 876 patients, they have found out that 9.7% of them are said to have chronic kidney disease. All right, that's basically 9 in 100 patients. Okay, now, in 2018, seven years down the line, what happened in my course, the study done, in 2018, in 1,048 patients, they found out that 15.5% of these patients are said to have chronic kidney disease. That's basically 15 in 100 patients. Isn't that alarming? Yes, it is. All right? Now, by age and gender, as we see, it is said that according to the estimations, about one in five men and one in four women in the ages around 65 to 74 and half of people aged 75 and above have chronic kidney disease. Okay, so no matter what happens, above the age of 60, you are at risk of having chronic kidney disease, providing, according to the Act Kicked, an act that was developed by the Ministry of Health Malaysia in the National Action Plan for Chronic Kidney Disease and Healthy Kidneys, they have said that diabetes, mellitus and hypertension is the risk factor for chronic kidney disease and due to the fact that Malaysia is having an increased pool of aging population that contributes to end-stage renal disease. All right? So this plan is targeted until 2025, ladies and gentlemen, and it's available at your dispense. Google it and read this, please. All right? Now, covering the introduction, covering the overview of chronic kidney disease, as nurses, we are entitled to understand how patients transition themselves into renal replacement therapy. Now, how do we do that? Number one, I would like to bring you to this pre-dialysis education, okay? The objective of pre-dialysis education is actually number one. The most important is to provide information 
and choices of renal replacement therapy, for example, hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, and renal transplant. Coming forward to that, secondary is that to help patients accept renal replacement therapy. You cannot just throw it to them. You cannot just simply tell them, go on, just do dialysis, bye-bye. No, we want to create awareness that they are given the opportunity to choose. Number two, to emphasize that eventually therapy is initiated based on certain clinical criteria, and to instill the understanding that therapy is meant to improve the quality of their life. Okay, if they opt for conservative therapy, as nurses, as physicians, as the whole healthcare personnel, we want to support their decision and to provide non-judgmental care, all right? To help integrate RRT into their lives, to avoid especially admission for emergent initiation where never possible. We don't want dialysis to be done emergency, all right? And also to mitigate the use of temporary excess, such as jugular or femoral dialysis catheters, all right? These are catheters that are inserted only for emergency cases that may cause risk of infections and further worse, worse outcomes, okay? All right, when to start CKD and pre-dialysis education? Now, the recommendation is that, number one, at CKD stage three, is an effort to provide education on delaying the progression of CKD. Now, why is it that we start at stage three? Is because advantage is there. It allows early education about diet, medication compliance, and of course, to delay as much as possible the onset of renal replacement therapy. The recommendation also carries on to say, at stage four of CKD, when the EGFR is below 30 mils per minute, at this point, patients should already receive education about renal replacement therapy. This allows for timely placement of permanent excess catheters or permanent excess means, all right, to address issues of donors if the patient is keen for transplant and to allow discussions for conservative treatment when requested means that if they don't want dialysis at least we direct them to the right person to the right physician to the right team okay now carrying on let's look at the role of ckd nurse educator all right we are just a person in a whole big pool of people in a healthcare system all right as nurses we want to identify the patient's goals and priorities. Ladies and gentlemen, every single individual, every single patient is different, okay? We cannot assume by putting forward a whole set of rules that they are able to just follow and we are just able to implement. No, every single individual patient has their goals and priorities. Personally, for myself, we have seen a lot, all right? Some patients, they, they come in with troubles of of economic, if they come in trouble with family issues, they come in trouble with personal matters that they just cannot think and sort out. So we need to help them in that sense. Second, identifying factors affecting their decision making. It's not simple when someone comes to you and tells you that you need dialysis, okay, just do it. No, there's a lot of factors that are gonna affect them making that decision at the end to do dialysis or not, okay? And as CKD nurse educators, they are to conduct a comprehensive pre-dialysis assessment. This allows not only the patient comfort, but also provides physicians with, you know, maybe points that is not there in the beginning of time. And also to know whether, you know, it, is it suitable that this option chosen can be done, right? For example, if the person chooses hemodialysis and he has a heart issue, could that be a problem soon? So we need to look into that thoroughly. Okay, now let's go to point number two and number three, that is to identify the factors affecting the decision-making and conducting a comprehensive pre-dialysis. Okay, I'll bring out that two points for us to look into deeper, all right? Number one, what could be the factors that affects the decision-making for long-term renal replacement therapy? In my years of conducting this session, I found out that all those pool of bubbles in that area there, you can see that their mind is filled with things such as, if I do dialysis, what happens to my job? If I do dialysis, what happens to my family? If I do dialysis, how long will I live? How about my diet? What about my fluid? What about going for dialysis? Who's going to send me? You know, all these bubbles are bursting in their minds 
And it comes to a point if we do not help them address that small issues, they eventually will disappear and that's it. Okay? So looking at all those bubbles, ladies and gentlemen, it's not an easy task simply to just push aside and tell them, well, never mind, do dialysis, I don't care. We cannot do that. All right? We need to look into as much as possible to provide help in addressing all those points, okay? Such as, for example, excess creation and endurance. A fistula creation is not something that we can just simply pump in into a patient. We need to look into their veins. We need to look into their heart function. We need to look into their echo results. Now, all these are very important criteria that need to be addressed before placing an excess, for example, okay? And one of it that I'm very much eager to share here is diet and fluid control. I have issues with so many patients that think after dialysis, it's heaven on earth eating. No, that's why we need to tell them in the beginning of time, if you're on dialysis, there's also a requirement that you need to control diet, okay? All right, so this patient, having all those things in their mind, may cause trouble if we do not help them. I re-emphasize and I'll focus this every time in my lecture to say that patients need guidance. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, now, pre-dialysis assessment, the general factors that is there in our session, number one, we will try to assess the progression of the kidney disease. All right, see how far have they fallen in their course of kidney disease. Following that, I will do a socioeconomic assessment, looking at their background, looking at the financial status, then, I will go into core morbid and compliance care. Core morbid and compliance care refers to looking at their diabetic control, looking at, at their hypertension control, looking at their gout history. All this can give us a better picture as to how they are as a person and as a patient. All right? Then, I will go into diet compliance and recall. Are they actually being referred to a dietitian? Are they actually following every single thing that has been mentioned? to control protein, to control potassium, to control phosphate, to control salt and everything. Are they doing it? If they're not, recall, refer back to the dietitians. Then I will slowly boom into renal replacement therapy, preparations, talking about their options. And last but not least, defining the excess needed for every option chosen. Okay? Right. Now, having this... You know, everything is not just a simple thing. We sometimes have to conduct sessions not once, not twice, three to four times with a single patient just to ensure that they have decided well, All right? And this task falls upon everyone in the system, not only us, everyone, okay? All right, now specifically, if you ask me, stage three, stage four, and stage five, Chronic kidney disease has their own criteria and assessment. All right, let's go into stage three. If the EGFR falls between 59% to 30%, I will provide emphasis on managing the comorbidities. That means looking into their diabetic control, hypertension control, gout control. I will highlight to them the signs and symptoms of chronic kidney disease. I will highlight the complications of chronic kidney disease. And I will also look into their compliance to medication and the use of alternative treatments, for example, like what we see now is rampant supplements, over-the-counter drugs, I just don't know. So we need to look into that and also to assess their diet. CKD stage 3, just that first, all right? So looking at stage 4 chronic kidney disease, as the EGFR falls between 29% to 16%, what we will do as educators, we will introduce and plan renal replacement therapy thoroughly looking into the hemodialysis, looking into peritoneal dialysis, and looking into preemptive transplant. Or if patient refuses dialysis, then we will assist in the conservative management part, for example, referring them to palliative care. Then I will, or we will engage family support in this whole discussion. I'll bring in the husband, I'll bring in the mother, I'll bring in the father, I'll bring in the siblings, all right? And going into deeper is that I will assess the socioeconomic status, the family support, financial assistance whenever needed, all right? And most important, at stage 4 chronic kidney disease, I will prepare for permanent access for long-term renal replacement therapy. If he chooses hemodialysis, I will assist in the AVF assessment part. AVF means arterial venous fistula assessment. 
If they choose peritoneal dialysis, I will assist in coordinating for PD orientation and plan for Tankov insertion. And if the patient chooses transplant, I will assist transplant orientation. Okay. Now, stage four, if you ask me, is a huge, huge stage because some patients, they may settle in stage four for a very, very long time. So we try our best not to lose them into our follow-up and we try to assess them from time to time. Okay. Now, the last stage of chronic kidney disease, stage five, when the EGFR falls below 15%, most important is I will conduct collaborative management of patient and caregivers in the continuous preparation for renal replacement therapy. It means that if I've seen them in stage four and they come in with me to see me in stage five, I will continue to assist in preparation. And I will reevaluate the options again. For example, this time around, they might change their mind and I will assist to move their options to another dimension by giving them the right information. And at this stage, I will ensure 100% that the permanent access is ongoing. Whatever operation is needed is ongoing. And of course, at stage five, when the kidneys are weak, I will assess any signs and symptoms of complications. For example, fluid overload, shortness of breath, uremic signs, vomiting, everything. And emphasize the need for any emergency management, such as we might want to urgently initiate hemodialysis. Now, Ladies and gentlemen, before I conclude my talk today, I would like to share that a nurse is not a nurse alone. She stands in a whole dimension of a multidisciplinary team consisting of the patient, the family. We have the doctors, we have the dietitians, we have the physiotherapists, we have the social workers. We need everyone to manage a patient properly. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention. Happy World Kidney Day 2021. Bye-bye.